Hello everyone and welcome to a new series from MMAC, Take 10. We'll get to know business and community leaders who are playing a significant role in building the future of Milwaukee, our region, and the state of Wisconsin. We'll dig into their big picture perspective on the opportunities and the threats we face as a region. I'm Chris Jenkins, MMAC's Director of Communications, and our guest today is Emily Phillips, Financial Advisor at RW Baird. So Emily, to start off, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little about your organization. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I was born in Milwaukee. I grew up outside of Boston and I came back to the Fresh Coast for school. And through a, a course of, of accidental review and, and life unfolding, I stayed here to pursue a career and family. And uh, it's been really rewarding ever since. I landed at Baird in 2013. I joined my business partner, Donna Drosner, in private wealth management. And Baird is, is, a, you know, is, a, is a household name here in the business community for obvious reasons, right? Culture, culture, culture. We are employee owned, which we're very proud of. It sets us apart from you know, peer organizations, uh, deep expertise, public private markets. Uh, as I said, I'm in the, the private wealth space, so I get to work with individuals and families on a daily basis, which is incredibly rewarding. It's it's uh, one part super nerd and like one part like sports agent pace. So uh, I have a lot of fun and uh, and, and I, I claim to be one of the luckiest people alive. That's absolutely terrific. Um, you're very active on social media. Uh, it's very clear through that activity that you care deeply about the future of Milwaukee. So I, I think you, you'd be a good person to answer this question. What's the biggest challenge we need to address in Milwaukee? Chris, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, you know what? Milwaukee's it's such a unique city. And, and I spend a lot of time with clients in, in our peer cities and in, in large cities. Uh, if I were to pick one thing that the, the city could change or, or you know the challenge we need to address, it's we really need to embrace a growth mindset. We need to, we need to be future forward. And because of a lot of the, the challenges that like sub challenges that the city faces, if we had more of a, a growth mindset, I think a lot of those things would be solved naturally and organically. That doesn't mean it doesn't require intention. Um, but if you create a competitive landscape, you're automatically going to recruit better talent. You're going to retain talent. You're going to bring corporations and non-government organizations, venture capital entrepreneurs. Um, it demands stronger integration across class, race, orientation. And, and frankly, the data is telling us that that's what next, next generation leaders need and want, and companies are responding to that. So if we can embrace a growth mindset, I think we really truly um, can set ourselves apart and, and set ourselves up for the future. Of course, the other side of that would be what makes you optimistic about the future of Milwaukee? You know, it's like all the same things, right? <laughs> so what challenges us, you know, is also our secret weapon in some ways. You know, as a, as a mid-market city, we're small enough that we can do anything we want to get done, right? Chris, you and I, we're one phone call away from whoever we want to reach out to regardless of how close we are, you know, with a personal or a business relationship. And, and as a mid-market city, we're also big enough to make a tremendous impact, you know, a national footprint, right? Like there's opportunity for us to, to really help influence and, and reshape some of the landscapes that our, that our country also faces with challenges. Um, so it's our tradition, it's our measured and balanced approach, which, which some people tend to say is too conservative. But it's also what holds us back from opportunity also keeps us out of trouble. So if we can use those cultural values, right, the archetype of, of sort of traditional Milwaukee to be able to, you know, study what other cities are doing and what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong so that we can use that same measured approach and how we implement policy and, and solve some of these challenges. I'm tremendously optimistic about Milwaukee. You know, I, I think that, that, again, we're small enough to do whatever we want to get done. So let's get started. I am so glad to hear you say that because I grew up in Chicago. I lived on the East Coast for a while and then I moved here. And one of the things that really stands out is exactly what you said is 
that it's small enough of a place where one person can make a difference, but it's big enough of a place where that difference could really matter. Like anybody you want to connect with is a couple of phone calls away, like you said. And I love you saying that that's our secret weapon because it is. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of that is reflective here in my job at Baird. We can do everything that all the big banks and all the players can do. What really se separates us from those institutions is that every relationship matters. And so when you have that level of quality and that level of, of connection, the sky really is the limit. You can scale that appropriately. And, and I love this city. It's why I've stayed. I've been recruited to the big cities. I'd love to go back to the East Coast maybe someday in the future, but my work here isn't done. And I'm constantly, constantly reminded of, of why I stay through the quality of people, through the quality of projects. And I truly believe, though we don't always agree, as a city, and though we definitely don't always agree as a region or a state, at the end of the day, each person I meet really does want the best for Wisconsin and Milwaukee included. Absolutely. Okay, now the fun part of the interview. And maybe imagine this in sort of a hopefully soon post-pandemic era. <laughs> Emerging on the other side. What, what, from, what should they zoom? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if someone from out of town is visiting Milwaukee or the region, what's one thing they can't miss? Oh, these are the tough ones. <laughs> you know, it totally depends on the on the profile of the tourist, right? I I talk to my friends at Visit Milwaukee and I say, you guys should create this app that that has this sort of custom opportunity for tourists to be able to you know to, to create a, an experience but a tailgating right i mean tailgating at a brewers game is just amazing and and as you know being from a larger city so many places don't have that opportunity either it's not a part of their cultural fabric or it's it's physically not possible right like i grew up going to to red sox games and you know tailgating is bar hopping <laughs> so right. and then anything to do with the lakefront. You know, we have such rich cultural assets, whether it's a foodie tour that takes you through Silver City or world-class museums like Discovery World. So depending on who the person is, you know, tailgating at a brewer's game, having, you know, having a beer at one of our many breweries, I think cultural assets, you know, so depending on the tourist profile, but, but you know, just taking a moment to be present in what this city has to offer, like it's a hidden gem in so many ways. Another tough one. What is your favorite local restaurant and what should I order if I go there? Oh, that's an easy one. Anyone who knows me or probably doesn't know me, but overhears me, uh, Elsa's on the park, hands down. Uh, Carl Kopp is a genius entrepreneur. What he did with his family custard stands that his mother started uh, developing a restaurant here back when nobody was developing in that part of town. Um, and what do you order? Again, you know, buyer's choice, but I'd say a martini, best in the city. Very nice. What was your first job and what's a lesson you learned from it? Ooh, I learned a lot of lessons. I think that probably comes from the many mistakes I've, I've uh, engaged in over my life, but depends, childhood, high school, college, corporate job, what, 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 uh, give me a category. Absolutely, first job, first time first, in the world. First job. The first time I transacted currency and made money, mm -hmm. I talked my sister into selling the beautiful watercolor landscapes that she was creating. And I said, let's throw them in a red wagon and go around the neighborhood and let's sell your art. I think it, I think it's really great. You're very talented. And she was like, okay, but I don't want to do any of the talking. And I said, I got it covered. So we, we went around the neighborhood and sold all of these beautiful watercolors, uh, much to my dismay when we came home with a handful of money and no art left. My mom asked us what we did and then probably told us to turn around and give it back to all the neighbors. So it was, a, it was an excellent lesson in having an idea, executing the idea, having a pretty fantastic profit margin. And then also the humbling aspect of when you realize it might not be the best solution for the neighborhood or brand building, I, I had to give it back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> what is the last book you read or are reading right now? Oh, as a researcher, I have to read like a hundred pages a day just for the job. So recreational reading can get a little tough, um, but I read a book, a bit of a hybrid business book, but also 
life book uh, called The Algebra of Happiness. So notes on the pursuit of success, love, and meaning, I believe is the full title. And it's not a long, extensive read. You can even, you know, chop it up. Uh, but the point is, how, do, how are you in the present, right? How do you really pursue intentionality and, and meaningfulness and, and what is contentment versus happiness, right? Like everyone always talks about this pursuit of this constant state of joy, but that is exhausting. So how do you really find meaning in, in today versus just being so hyper-focused on goals and accomplishments and attainment and, and those things? Really great book. So even for folks that aren't into business books or, or motivational books, I, I really like it. It was awesome read. What show should I stream? Oh, this is not a good question for me, but uh, I did watch the the uh, trending rave of the Queen's Gambit, and I did like it. A good a good friend of mine talked me into watching it, and then texted me a couple times to see if I had watched it. So so I did watch it, and I really loved the portrayal of a brilliant human out of place, right in a peer group, and the the involvement of finding something she was really good at and loved, and then watching that struggle of being brilliant amongst average humans, amongst, you know, peer humans, and then sort of that growth process, right? Like the struggles of that, sort of the art and science of, of uh, something. So I loved it. Anything with strategy, intellectualism, and and a, and a bit of, a, a, I don't know, just color. It was a really cool show. Very nice. What is your favorite inspirational quote? Uh, inspirational quote. The one by Einstein that I really love is, uh, you have to learn the rules of the game and then play better than everyone else. It's something that's spoken to me for a long period of time, being sort of an unconventional professional in the financial services industry. Uh, this industry tends to uh, run a little bit uh, dynastically in a lot of ways. And so being a first generation you know, American in, in several categories. This is something that has always been a challenge to me. And this quote has has really spoken to me. So you learn the rules of the game and then and then you compete, right? Then then get after it. And the one piece I like to layer in, uh, it wouldn't be authentic if I didn't add it is, you know, and if the rules don't always make sense, change them. That's great. What is one thing people might not know about you? Yeah. I sound like a broken record every time I answer this, you know, whether it's in print or an interview or whatever, but like, I, I'm pretty shy, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a loner in a lot of ways. Introverts can be outgoing and, and can be good with people. It's how you recharge and, and where you can do some of your best work, right? So I can, I can, you know, be around a lot of people and I have a lot of fun. Trust me, I'm a social animal in a lot of ways, uh, but I really seek out the peace and solitude and, you know, and, and big crowds and a lot of things or people that I'm not familiar with. I tend to be a little bit more of an observer before I jump in. Um, and I found that when you have that, when you create that space where you can be the most productive, you know, when it's quiet, like my imagination and my drive, that's where I architect some of the, you know, most awesome plans that I've pursued, you know? So I, even though people don't believe it, I am, I'm, I'm shy and I'm an introvert, but, uh, but I also love people. So it's a balance. Well, thank you, Emily, for your time today. You can watch additional Take 10 episodes on MMAC's YouTube channel, our email newsletter, and on our social media channels. Thanks everybody and have a great day.